uh, Albert Ruther, Lincoln Laboratory Supercomputing Center, LLSC. Uh, he brought supercomputing to Lincoln Labs through the establishment of LL Grid, which is on-demand grid computing with MATLAB. He's a founder of LLSC, and he leads their computational science and engineering team. He's also the computer system architect of MIT's SuperCloud. And uh, for that, he won an Eaton Award for Design Excellence from Purdue University, our shared alma mater. We were just talking about that. Go uh, his, <laughs> his areas of research include interactive HPC, uh, computer architectures for machine learning, graph analytics, and signal processing, and computational engineering. And today, he's going to tell us about inter enabling interactive on-demand high-performance computing for rapid prototyping and machine learning there at LLSC. So uh, Albert, please, uh, please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. I am excited to talk to you about, uh, about on-demand high-performance computing. Um, let's just hop right into the, into the outline here. Hmm. Here we go, I think. There we go. All right. So today, um, I have uh, I'm sharing about 18 or so years of a journey that we started at Lincoln in uh, January of 2002, uh, where we were um, looking for ways to share parallel computing capabilities in the in the uh, culture as well as the needs for the for Lincoln Laboratory. So I'm going to start off with uh, in the introduction to tell you a little bit more about Lincoln Laboratory. It's uh, common. I think everybody knows MIT, but uh, plenty of people really don't know too much about Lincoln Laboratory and the, that other part of uh, MIT. Um, and in doing that, I, I want to share with you kind of the, the premise with which we built our interactive HPC capability. Um, I'm then going to share with you um, four lessons learned, uh, three under the three under the uh, interactive HPC uh, um, bullet, and then we'll talk about metrics uh, in and of themselves. And then I thought it would be good to share a couple of technologies that um, are key to providing interactive capability. Uh, one is uh, preemptible batch ex job executions, and then uh, we'll finish off with Jupyter notebook portals. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Lincoln Laboratory. It was uh, it came out of MIT campus, uh, out of the radiation laboratory, or Rad Lab. The Rad Lab was very active in the 30s and 40s and designed about half of all US World War II radars for surveillance, fire control, navigation systems. Um, but at the end of World War II, the question really was, what do we do with all this technology for national defense? And uh, Vannevar Bush and others uh, saw an opportunity to establish a federally funded research and development center. And they actually moved the Rad Lab uh, about 20 miles off of campus onto Hans a fairly new, newly made Hanscom Air Force Base in Lexington, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, the first pr project was the semi-automated ground environment, the SAGE system, which was a system to detect and react to uh, Russian bombers coming over the poles, over the North Pole, um, which was a large distributed radar architecture with real-time computing uh, at the center of it that happened to be from a, a, a small company uh, that did lots of processing called IBM. Um, coming from that, uh, including the partnership with IBM, but a lot of other capabilities was that uh, Lincoln developed and demonstrated was real-time computing capabilities. Uh, magnetic core memory came out of that, as well as light pen CRT interfaces um, that uh, came, that was uh, part of that early uh, experiment uh, with interacting with computers and reacting to uh, bomber threats. Um, fast forwarding now to, uh, to 2020, and uh, the laboratory is a lot bigger. Um, the original buildings are still um, here on campus. Uh, there are these cluster of buildings in the middle um, that, uh, let's see, do the spotlight thing. 
Um, the cluster of buildings right here in the middle are some of the original A, B, C, and D buildings, but uh, campus is a lot larger, many more employees. We're up to about 4,000 employees, but it's all in the support of national security. And we take advantage of our ties with MIT campus to uh, work both with uh, researchers on campus, but actually also work with researchers um, all over the country uh, in finding um, capabilities that can be used for national security uh, to uh, apply to national security problems. Our key roles are in system architecture engineering, um, technology development, and system prototyping. And uh, I, ha I don't have the update yet. We actually added a, an 11th mission area in biosecurity, uh, bio sensing and security. Um, all of this really revolves around sensing technologies. Um, and I should say these, these 10 mission areas we've been serving for about 10 years when the most recent one of cybersecurity was added. Um, all of this uh, in terms of focus areas uh, is, whoops, uh, is uh, about um, long range, broad uh, technology developments uh, that cross mission areas. Um, it comes from then and analyzing what what we want to sense and what we want to detect and doing uh, system analysis and testing. Um, once solutions have been proposed, uh, we go into rapid prototyping capabilities. And then at that point, we usually hand things off to, uh, to contractors like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon, oftentimes uh, integrating and working with them on teams to even build the rapid prototype so that the handoffs are, are more effective and do not take as long to transition. Um, we're also brought in often as trusted government advisors, just as, as you often are. Um, and uh, do a lot of outreach in terms of conferences, workshops, and such. Um, and we pride ourselves in having good university affiliations, not just with MIT. Um, well, I mentioned the SAGE system, um, but there is a, a long history of supercomputing at Lincoln. Um, you know, I'm over here in 1951, I mentioned the Whirlwind computer. Whirlwind was that first IBM computer that was integrated in what is F building in our complex. Um, that then uh, led to a number of other capabilities. Uh, TX0 and TX2 came out of that for the transistor experiment computers. Um, TX2 was actually then the host for uh, Sketchpad, which was the first interactive system um, that was fielded at Lincoln. Um, there's a number of, of uh, companies that have spun out of Lincoln. Uh, among them are Digital Equipment Corporation, as well as, uh, to a large degree, Sun Microsystems. And actually, Ivan Sutherland, the, uh, one of the founders of Sun, was one of the brains behind uh, the Sketchpad and the TX2 interactive computing capabilities. Well, in the ensuing years, somewhere, somewhere in like the early 80s or so, a lot of the, com the unclassified computing capability kind of dried up and a lot of the high-end computing capability that the lab had went classified. Um, it was seen though in the mid 90s or so that there was kind of a resurgence of unclassified computing needs. And the group that I joined in 2001 started in the, in the 90s to try and find a way to bring parallel computing to a broader audience, mainly at the laboratory for sensor signal processing. Because most of what, what Lincoln does is sensor processing from designing the sensors all the way to getting intelligence and information out of it to make good, good decisions. Um, they actually tried three times uh, with C, plus, C and C++ libraries, including this uh, space-time adaptive processing library, Staple, which was a, par it was a parallel native library to enable sensor signal processing for radars. The trouble that they had was it, it was actually really um, well received among expert programmers, but it was not particularly accessible. And it wasn't until the early aughts um, when Jeremy Kepner, Nadia Bliss, and I um, started developing MATLAB MPI and PMATLAB um, that we started getting some traction in parallel, uh, general parallel library adoption within the laboratory. The whole reason was that in C and C++, it usually, that was the transition language that these signal processing codes would go to. All of the rapid prototyping and uh, early development was done in MATLAB at the time. Um, and so recognizing that 
uh, MATLAB was kind of the, the rapid prototyping language gave us then an opportunity and a platform with which to start um, making uh, parallel computing and parallel uh, signal processing and parallel data analysis uh, more feasible even very early on in programs. Um, so my role in MATLAB MPI and PMATLAB was with um, writing the verification code and the documentation and training for using it. And in doing my verification, I got frustrated really quickly because I would I, I had to run in parallel to test these codes. And I had a Sun Microsystems workstation at my desk. And I would have to burrow into other people's backgrounds to see if I could get some cycles off of their desktop machines. Um, my group did not have a cluster yet. And uh, so that didn't last very long. My burrowing in and, you know, I'd have windows open all over the place of like how much load was on, the, on these different computers. So I wrote my own scheduler. That also didn't last long because the scheduler was pretty bad. It did not have the features that I really wanted. Um, so I started integrating MATLAB MPI and then eventually PMATLAB with, um, with the Condor scheduler from University of Wisconsin. Um, subsequently, we have ported Grid MATLAB to PBS, um, Grid Engine, uh, LSF, and now Slurm. So I think we have experience with all five major schedulers, and I think we're going to stick with Slurm for a while. I, I really like Slurm a lot. Um, but then we also started fielding clusters because our uh, upper management started seeing that, they were we, that we were getting more and more users using PMATLAB, MATLAB MPI, and Grid MATLAB. And so you can see uh, down here, uh, this was our first, very first cluster of 32 nodes with a switch and a small array of, of storage. Um, and uh, it, the, the capability really blossomed. Uh, Jeremy Kepner and I and Nadia, we all worked, Nadia Bliss, we all worked in a basically a parallel processing and embedded systems group. And this was a great way for us to um, do prototyping of those codes before actually having uh, system hardware that we would deploy upon. And some of those examples are here, like the, this Casper processor. Some of their early development was done on the TX2500 cluster uh, before going to Mercury hardware, uh, Mercury embedded hardware. Fast forwarding then um, to 2016, uh, we were spun out of a uh, data analysis group uh, into the Lincoln Supercomputing Center, uh, which uh, is now its own entity within the laboratory. And we have, we're kind of half and half at the laboratory and on campus to spur um, collaborations with MIT campus and the broader university community. Um, and so uh, I'll get to that in a few slides. What we deliver it for our mission areas uh, that have a lot of vast, vast, vast amounts of data from lots and lots of sensors is that we have a vertically integrated capability that matches their development, uh, their development workflows. Um, we run our own data centers. We have our own hardware. We develop our own software stack. Um, we have our own user support team, which is the team that I lead. And then we also, uh, publish on both the tools that we create as well as the capabilities that we bring to bear uh, for those for the software and hardware th uh, that we have. Actually, we even actually publish on the data centers. Um, I have a couple slides at the very end uh, to show you some of the, the fun stuff that we've been doing with data centers, uh, data center management. Um, we Because we specialize in high productivity languages, um, we often are more productive than standard supercomputing, um, but you'll see that I don't want to, you know, paint the, this wonderful picture that we've solved uh, solved world peace. Uh, there are there are things that we don't do well, um, but in terms of uh, our high productivity uh, capabilities uh, for our users, uh, we're quite productive. And we've done a lot of comparisons to clouds. Actually, I've been kind of the lead on cloud computing and doing the comparisons there. And we, um, because we have, and I, I know I'm speaking to the, to the choir here, because we have very integrated capabilities, um, we, we know what our hardware can do and we know how to get that performance out of the hardware, which is very challenging to do in the cloud. So given that, let's jump into these lessons learned from from uh, enabling interactive HPC for Lincoln Lab. Um, as we've been on this 18 year or so journey, um, 
we found that we it is as much a cultural expectation as it is a technology uh, capability. Um, and that cultural shift involves, uh, we've distilled it down into four key lessons learned. I imagine if we thought about it harder, we probably could ma make more key lessons, but let's stick with four. Um, the first one is it's broadening the definition of interactive HPC in terms of what uh, development environments we enable, what web-based capabilities we have, and it all really centers around the user's laptops and desktops. Um, we are not in, we, we are in the, I don't know how to say this kindly, we're in the unfortunate situation, but fortunate situation, where we, our general user does not have any HPC experience. And I think that's very much in contrast to, to what you all uh, experience, where I would imagine many grad students and undergrads that come and work at a national lab um, have experience. Uh, many of our folks uh, just, they may know how many cores that our laptop has, and that may, might be it. Um, and so we have to find ways to uh, reach them at their level, both in terms of helping them understand what they're using and kind of learning, teaching them how to fish rather than just giving them fish. Um, the other one is providing interfaces to our systems that are familiar enough from their experience on laptops and desktops and tablets for that matter now that they aren't completely spooked and just want to run the other way. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about re-architecting for interactive HPCs. Our systems on the surface look similar to uh, conventional supercomputers, but there are some, um, there are some differences and I'll talk about that and how we integrate them into the into the desktop experience and laptop experience from our users. Um, we see this continuum expanding the HPC ecosystem is talking about how uh, how we deliver the software as well as how do we deliver training and then of course reframing the metrics is expanding the metrics um, from just utilization discussions to utilization and other metrics that are important, especially important for the user. And because it's important for the user, it is important for the organization. So let's jump in on the first one, the broadening of the definition. Um, for us, the experience of our users uh, really starts and ends with the experience that they have with their laptops and desktops. And so um, the early, you know, I talked about the early, the mid aughts, the 2002 to 2004, five range. Um, we were all about MATLAB um, because 95% of the code that was built was being written at Lincoln was MATLAB code. And so early on, you know, I talked about integrating the scheduler with MATLAB. Um, and that was because I found that the users really were in, it wasn't just that they were enamored with that interface, it was that they were just so familiar with it. Um, and so what uh, I ended up doing with the scheduler was basically launching N minus one MATLABs in the cluster that came alongside their desktop or laptop. Um, and that reassured them that at, at their desktop, they could get all the feedback, all the graphs, all the text uh, output that they normally would get at their desktop while getting uh, speed up by using the uh, using the cluster for what I called go fast juice. Um, it has since expanded to, as you can see here, uh, we run uh, dynamic Hadoop environments. We run lots of Python. We run Julia, Java code. Um, but that's not to say that we also, we have plenty of Fortran and C++ compilers on board. Um, we also, interestingly, uh, run databases because we find that the file system isn't the only thing that users need to, to manage their data. They're often prototyping with databases. And so by providing dynamic databases, um, they also, uh, they are able to use more of our resources and integrate more uh, within our, our capabilities. Um, and in terms of the rapid prototyping, it is for uh, algorithm development, data analysis, and machine learning training, as well as inference. Some also do application steering from their desktop and from login nodes, and now more uh, even visualization. Um, let's see. Let me give you a few examples of what, what this looks like for them. Uh, along the top are some IDEs that we support uh, from, of course, Parallel MATLAB. I, I, I should take a real quick, quick uh, uh, 
subroutine call for you here, a method call. Um, you're probably wondering, uh, and I'm just going to answer the question that might be on your mind. Um, well, what about this MATLAB, parallel MATLAB, parallel server capability from MATLAB? Um, so RP MATLAB was one of 29 uh, parallel MATLAB capabilities that were out in the published uh, and published uh, articles. And uh, we got, we as well as a few folks from campus got the attention of MathWorks um, that uh, actually uh, Cleve Moeller uh, had written an article in 1995 saying there will never be a parallel MATLAB. Well, he, he, uh, he admitted that that was uh, 10 years ago at that time. And he brought us in along with some folks from MIT campus. And Jeremy Kepner and I actually met with folks at MathWorks monthly for like a two year plus period to help them build what became what has become their parallel MATLAB, which is a very, very capable uh, interface as well. So end of subroutine call. Uh, that's how that fits into the whole picture. We are capable of running their P parallel MATLAB as well, along with our PMATLAB on our clusters. Um, so we have this parallel MATLAB capability. We have Jupyter Notebooks. We'll get into that a little bit later. And we have dynamic databases. We mainly run Accumulo, SciDB, and PostgreSQL databases that are all accessible through uh, our uh, web portal capability that will be at uh, near the end of the talk. Um, we also found that users just sometimes want to use a Linux box. Um, because they happen to be on Windows or Mac OS, they just want to kind of rent a Linux uh, machine or a fraction of a Linux machine. So we enable that for inter interactive hardware. Um, we found a lot of users doing bulk synchronous processing, so Ma MapReduce style processing, and they'd come to us saying, we want MapReduce. And uh, we'd have to tell them, you know, the Hadoop MapReduce really doesn't solve your problem, but we've written some wrappers around job arrays in the scheduler that just make it very intuitive for you to do MapReduce. And then finally, um, some of our users um, use dynamic web, develop dynamic web services, uh, much like they do in the cloud, and they'll prototype uh, and integrate that with other uh, of our services. So we enable a, a dynamic web service capability. Well, let's talk a little bit more about har the hardware that we've got uh, and how it differs from uh, conventional supercomputers. Um, so we run two unclassified systems. TX Green uh, is a system of systems uh, that is available to the labor to laboratory employees only, and then we run a a uh, collaborative system called TX E1. Uh, it's for engaging supercomputing one. Um, you notice we use the TX uh, in homage to TX0 and TX2 that were on that history chart. Um, and we have every intention to continue to use TX as our, uh, our monikers, our, the starts of our monikers for our systems. Um, in terms of processing capability and storage and such, uh, they are, they're much the same as any uh, large compute nodes. Um, and we, we house these out in three locations, actually. Um, one of them is in that F building. Remember, I talked about the original Whirlwind and TX computers being an F building. Well, our laboratory data center continues to be an F building. Um, but we also have assets about 90 miles away from Lexington in Holyoke, right in the center of the state. Um, the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center, the MGHPCC, houses TX E1. And then about three blocks away, we have these um, Hewlett Packard Ecopods uh, down by the Connecticut River um, that helps for cooling uh, some of the assets. Um, but these Ecopods are uh, modular uh, um, data centers um, that we originally purchased in order to help the DOD and other um, government uh, entities prototype the use of modular uh, data centers. Um, and uh, within the past couple of years, we added a second Ecopod because we kind of we burst at the seams of the first one. Um, in terms of uh, processing nodes, I'll get a little bit more into the processor types on the next slide. But where some of our, our capabilities diverge is in the um, in the, the storage. So we use we do use Lustre, but we use uh, Lustre file systems based on DDN and Seagate arrays. And they are tuned for very fast metadata accesses with reasonably fa fast data ac accesses. So we have um, clustered metadata servers taking the latest from the, the uh, Lustre file system capabilities. And then the other thing that is rather unique about our systems is that for the most part, we only use Ethernet. And um, 
we have had, so the storage, the two storage systems, I should go a little bit more into detail there. We have home, home uh, accounts on one of the storage systems. Um, and then we have a groups where we do collab groups uh, file system where we do collaboration uh, between uh, users and teams. Um, the, there's an InfiniBand network that uh, is in the background of those storage networks. Um, but uh, we generally do not field our systems with InfiniBand or OmniPath. We do have OmniPath networks available. Um, and if users really need to use OmniPath, we will, uh, we will enable them, but our default is to use Giggy. Our current networks are uh, 10 gig and 25 gig networks, depending on the, 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 uh, the processor types and when we bought them. And the other thing that's rather unique is that um, our topology continues to be a, a, basically a star network. We use enormous uh, thousand plus, um, a thousand plus uh, plug uh, ethernet switches. So core uh, data center core switches um, to uh, connect all of them. And so pretty much it's a single hop between any one compute node and the storage, as well as other compute nodes. Um, we really take the system of systems uh, to perhaps to the extreme in that we have an awful lot of different processors on board. Um, and it's basically the money that's available that year to buy, to buy stuff. Uh, the latest system are the processors here on the complete right, the Cascade Lake and the Voltas that we fielded um, about a year ago. And that one uh, debuted at number 42 on the top 500 uh, last November. Um, and that's what started filling the second ecopod. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that there, there's trade-offs between interactivity and optimal utilization for batch queuing. And um, I use this chart to show that we really are on a continuum between doing all batch and doing uh, very optimized uh, uh, launching of jobs and, and dispatching jobs onto compute nodes. And at the other extreme, doing all immediate scheduling, uh, where everything that gets run gets run immediately. And if you can't run immediately, you get denied uh, a launch. Um, both of those really of, often have their, their challenges, because with all batch, uh, it often means high latency before execution. And that can um, sometimes, uh, depending on allocations, can mean uh, what, what we affectionately call kitchen sinking of like figuring out every single parameter that you want to sweep across and just launching everything that you can and letting the scheduler figure out when things get run. But sometimes you get jobs to complete in days uh, that wait for days before they even begin execution. On the far other uh, extreme, you have um, you can have frequent scheduler flooding. And I know that from personal experience because you know I, I wrote Grid MATLAB to work with Condor. I was kind of green behind the ears. Uh, and uh, it took a few flooding events before I realized that I really needed to start doing uh, prioritization of jobs so that we didn't run into flooding. Um, I know that most most centers are somewhere in the middle with batch batches with reservations and batches with queues that do do uh, full interactivity. Um, and the way that we handle it is with interactivity first, just because of the nature of Lincoln business. Um, but we do also accommodate batch uh, queue jobs. Um, we do limit users uh, to how many how much how much of the system that they can occupy at a given time. The defaults are usually somewhere around a 20th to a 16th of the total capability. Um, and the, at any given time, they can use as much as about a quarter of the full system to run their jobs um, for. And we carefully manage those folks who are running at the higher allocations. Um, we do sometimes have individuals who say, there's, there's plenty of processing left. Why can't I have it? We'll address that at the end with that preemptive capabilities. In terms of our jobs, you know, I would have kind of hit the hit the um, hit the point home. Um, we came up, with, I came up with this this cores versus duration plot um, that we've been using for over a decade. Uh, the plot on the left here shows the number of cores used in a job against the duration of the job, and we see that the dense the broad the 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 density of the plot is really in this um, inter what we call interactive supercomputing region which is jobs that run in less than three hours of wall clock time, um, 
but occupy uh, more than 20 hours of 20 minutes of CPU time, but less than three hours of wall clock time. And so that those are jobs that often require kind of a, a quicker turnaround. Um, and it is really all about the link and workflow. Most of our users are when they're doing data analysis, they're getting understanding of what's in the data as they're running. And it's not uncommon for them to cut a job off 10, 20, 30 minutes into the processing because they know what they want to run next. And the rest of the processing doesn't matter anymore. They, 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 they're just, let's cut this one off. Let's change the parameters. Let's change the algorithms and let's look at what's wh where it needs to go next. Um, so uh, the more that they can do these uh, uh, observational turns, these uh, innovation turns per day, the more productive they are. Um, we do have some folks running really small jobs, like under 20 minutes of CPU time. Often that's just kind of like debug queue or something like that. And we do have others that are running very large jobs over, that run for hours and even days, um, both on a few, but also on a lot of processors too. So let's talk a little bit more. Now we've talked about hardware. Let's talk some more about software. Um, much like uh, I, I understand uh, your software ecosystem is, we install a lot of stuff and we allow our users to install a lot of stuff. Um, we have the usual C, C++, Fortran. Uh, I think we have five different C compilers, C and C++ compilers, two Fortran compilers. Um, five versions of MPI, a partridge in a pear tree of machine learning frameworks, um, debuggers, databases, and high productivity languages. Um, much of that we use mo link Linux modules for, but I wanted to uh, go to a little bit more depth on what we do for the high productivity languages like MATLAB and Julia and Python. Um, for MATLAB, we have f the five most recent versions available, and we, we do have storage on every compute node. So we install that locally so that launch time of the MATLABs are, is very low. Same with, same with actually all of these high productivity languages. Furthermore, um, we have some Python Anaconda environments that we build and configure for our users with an awful lot of uh, mod, um, packages in them. Um, with the intent, uh, and the, we, we also install those uh, locally on each node, again, for runtime. The other thing that these high productivity languages do that um, is, it's not as well understood until you run into the problem, is that um, because they are uh, just-in-time compilation, they, they often do stats on whether the, um, the libraries, the modules, the um, packages are available. And so you'll see this stat storm if you put Python on, in your central file system or MATLAB or for that matter in Julia, you'll see these stat storms of metadata accesses while it's traversing the tree of what is available in, the, in that uh, just-in-time compilation environment. And so what we're doing by installing them locally is that um, we are keeping all that traffic to the local storage. Um, it's worth addressing. We used to it's worth addressing our, our Linux mod, our uh, great affection for Linux modules. We love that uh, capability because we can cater our users' uh, environments to what they want to see, rather than showing them everything that's installed. Um, we uh, naturally, it's challenging with so much software to do everything in environment uh, like bash RCs and launch scripts. But we, with the overhead for virtual machines, we really only want to use that when we really, really have to. We did have a virtual machine capability using QMU and KVM, but we have had so little use of that that we have kind of let that uh, wither away for the time being. We can resurrect it if we need to. However, we do also use singularity containers. Um, for certain situations. Um, and it usually means that our users are doing some sort of collaboration with other organizations and government entities where those singularity containers become uh, a godsend for them to move uh, entire environments around. But uh, yeah, we love Linux modules a lot. I'm going to do a quick run through of a few of these uh, software technologies that we use. Uh, we have an interactive parallel MATLAB, as I discussed. And basically, it's a PGAS language for MATLAB. Um, I'm confident that uh, there's a lot of familiarity, familiarity with uh, 
uh, par um, parallel global address space uh, languages. Um, I love it. Um, and uh, PMATLAB just enables that and up to four dimensions of parallelism through uh, that capability. And integrating that with Grid MATLAB allows us to launch those uh, onto our clusters. The other one that I mentioned a little bit earlier is LO MapReduce. Um, so frequently we get users that uh, ask for, um, you know, I just have a folder or multiple folders of input data that I want to run through the same executable. Um, how do I do it? So we developed this uh, capability to make it very simple. Um, it came out of necessity. Uh, trying to explain job arrays to someone who is completely new to parallel processing um, was uh, not that easy. And so we kind of use this as a way to bridge to their experiences um, to explain to them on a file oriented basis what they were trying to do. So uh, a fair amount of, of jobs now are, are bulk synchronous and are using this LL MapReduce capability. Um, another nice thing about uh, this this wrapper is that um, when we change when when we have changed from one scheduler to another, we could um, change the bindings to the underlying scheduler without changing the environment for our users. Then there's a few other um, a number of other technologies. I want to highlight four of them here. Two of them in databases, and then. Uh, of course, uh, so Big Dog Polystore is a multi-database uh, framework for integrating data sets from that you can query against multiple databases to. Um, it's pretty interesting because you then allow uh, users to use the correct database for the data type and data access patterns that you have and integrate the, the results from queries and such um, at the, at the uh, user level um, rather than in the database. Similar to that is the, uh, the Graphulo uh, um, library for the Cumulo database, which allows you to do graph operations um, like breadth first search and, um, uh, oh, I don't know, um, uh, triangle counting uh, within the database itself. Um, that takes some of its cues from D4M, which is an associative array language for MATLAB, Octave, Julia, and Python. Um, that also enables graph processing in a sparse linear algebra mindset. And then finally, I think you're all familiar with Julia. Um, we were the original funders of the, the uh, technical team at uh, MIT that developed Julia, uh, and we enabled Julia on our system. We're not all about technology. We're a team of about 20, 22 people um, that are system engineers and computational engineers. Um, that uh, have produced an awful lot of uh, documents for our users and use cases for our users um, and uh, also teach a fair amount of tutorials. Um, we have refined our expert consulting model to work with users, providing a lot of uh, training capabilities. And we have uh, several of our researchers are active uh, with um, you and your colleagues uh, in the education for HPC capabilities um, across, across our country and across the world for that matter. And more recently, um, we have been uh, in the past 10 years or so have been using the open edX platform to deliver some of our, our materials both internally and for sponsors externally um, to help them use our clusters and understand Lincoln technologies better. So um, we've been recently uh, working hard on creating courses uh, in various topics on machine learning as well. So this brings us to metrics, the fourth uh, lesson learned that we talked about. Um, utilization is great, but it often is very centric to the actual hardware and how we're, how we're using the hardware that uh, our sponsors and organizations have so graciously helped us purchase. But it doesn't give a good indication of, of the, how the users are experiencing the use. And at an organization like Lincoln, where turnaround time and engineering cycles per day are so important, um, utilization was uh, often counterproductive to our, to our management understanding whether we were serving our users best. Um, Jeremy and I were active, uh, as I imagine so several of you were probably active in the high productivity computing systems project from DARPA. Um, one of the things that came out of the productivity analysis team was a reformulation of how what what it meant to be productive on supercomputers. 
And um, it, it all goes back to microeconomics, um, where you, uh, you, uh, you look at your return on investment or productivity as we defined it as your utility uh, over cost. Um, it is really easy, well, the, on the surface, it's really easy to measure your costs. Um, it's often the software cost, maintenance cost, and system cost. But there's actually a few other costs. We'll get to utility in a moment, but uh, let's, let's do the easy one. Let's look at cost first. There's uh, actually more than just those three costs that are involved um, in uh, defining your cost. There is actually um, coming from folks who use a lot of serial codes and want to parallelize them, there is the time to parallelize, parallelize the code. There's also the time to train the users on how to parallelize the code. Um, the t we actually even brought in the time to launch because interactivity is so important that time to launch, the time to execute um, really needed to be in our denominator for productivity. And then of course, there's the system cost and administration costs that you saw on the previous slide. Um, in the references that are at the bottom here, um, my co-authors and I go into a number of ways to measure the numerator. Um, in this case, uh, for uh, LL Grid and now LLSC, we use the time saved by users because that is ultimately what we're trying to do is help them uh, gain greater insights in their data analysis and machine learning and rapid prototyping. And so time is of the essence um, and uh, that's the key for them. Um, in the, the Titchener and Ruther article, uh, the bottom one from CT Watch, uh, we go into other things like trying to monetize um, what is the innovation opportunity of certain developments of projects, um, or you could even say uh, somehow put a, mo a money value on getting a cover story for um, Science Magazine or something like that, or Cell Magazine, uh, the, the top journals in the country. Those it could even be uh, a, uh, a utility uh, opportunity for this, this type of uh, processing. Um, in terms of that processing, we have for then formulas on how to capture uh, each of the components here. Um, and uh, it's detailed more in, in both of those papers below. Um, but uh, what we found, let's go to some numbers. Um, these numbers come from, I actually, I have to confess, I haven't run these numbers in a number of years. This comes from some older slides that we were in the thick of uh, justifying our, process, our, our way of doing interactive computing. Um, but the, the key thing here is at the very bottom, this benefit versus cost ratio. Um, when I did uh, the um, when I did the time saved by users on a linear scale of the number of CPUs used, um, the ROI just blew up. It was crazy, and I started getting discredited of like you, you know you've got crazy numbers. This doesn't really make sense. So I then started developing multiple other ways of looking at it. The other comparison that I show here is a log two uh, logarithmic um, measure of the the amount of uh, time saved and benefit to the users uh, based on the number of CPUs used, the amount of parallelism being used. Um, so this is the four lessons learned. How about we take a pause if there's any questions before I go into the two technologies um, that I wanted to highlight. So Albert, there are a couple questions that accumulated in the chat. Uh, okay. If you can open up the chat window. I just um, did. Yeah. I think people maybe didn't want to interrupt your stream there. Um, I appreciate it, but I also appreciate the questions. Excellent. Um, so do we run Rocky over Ethernet for the thousand plus star networks? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, we actually just uh, last week at IEEE HPEC published a paper doing um, uh, distributed uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch training um, and showing Rocky versus OmniPath. Um, on our on that TX Gaia system on that uh, Volta system, um, yes, we we use Rocky a lot. Um, we have we also have uh, GPU Direct turned on, but we haven't seen as much uh, benefit on GPU Direct. Um, and yes, uh, the other piece to that, diving one level deeper into it, is that we are very strategic about the Ethernet network cards that we buy, as well as the switches that we use in order to get the best gains out of, out of Rocky and Ethernet. Um, 
Ha ha. I'm going to jump to the third question. I'll come back to Annette's question in just a moment. Uh, is there a significant amount of MPI work in addition to other workload types that you mentioned? Um, significant, there is, it's significant in terms of our mission, but it is in terms of the overall mix of our jobs, uh, MPI jobs end up be, being around 10% of our workload. Um, probably a little bit less, but some of those are the most important, you know, radar cross-section studies, um, uh, computational fluid dynamics studies. Actually, let me tell you a fun story with that. Um, the, the MPI style jobs in terms of computational fluid dynamics, structural dynamics, and things like that are tend to be interactive in nature as well. And uh, this story kind of uh, uh, paints the picture. We were talking with our um, mechanical engineering, our, our design group that does a lot of the, um, uh, about 10% of the number of jobs. I don't know what it is in terms of number of hours to answer that fourth question. We were talking to our uh, mechanical engineering team uh, who use uh, structural dynamics, computational fluid dynamics codes extensively. And um, we were trying to get a picture of like, what is their workflow? How do they do their work? And they said, okay, here's the job that we have. We have two weeks to do all the computational runs possible. To det they were tasked with um, modifying, uh, adding a pod to the side of a, um, two propeller, uh, what's called a, a bee, a, what is it, the beaver or something like that. Um, no, the, the otter. Um, it's this two engine plane with a high wing that's great for mounting a whole bunch of sensors underneath. And they were going to mount another sensor on this thing. And they said, basically, we have two weeks to figure out what, which of the pod designs we want to use so that this plane doesn't fall out of the air. Like, okay, talk about rapid prototyping. Um, now we could totally know. And they, they'll run like uh, hundreds to thousands of iterations of fairly short uh, CFD jobs to determine what the optimal uh, pod design is. Um, so that kind of gives you a picture of the kind of jobs that even our MPI users do. Very seldomly do they go um, over a week. Actually, our distributed machine learning jobs, which do use MPI um, with Horovod, are tending to run longer than our uh, physical simulation jobs. And then let's come back to Annette's question. Is there is your parallel MATLAB equivalent to the parallel toolbox or the parallel server? Um, it is more like parallel server. Um, we take advantage of parallel toolbox in using parallel toolbox to take advantage of the GPUs on board, but it is it is the launching capability through the scheduler and the messaging capability that PMATLAB uh, does kind of as a as a, another solution to parallel MATLAB. So any other questions? And actually, we'll, hopefully we'll have some time. I trust we'll have some time I, at the end. I yeah. A, I had a clarification. Um, so you said that in, uh, you said that about 10% of your workload are MPI jobs. Is that 10% of the number of jobs or 10% of the hours taken by MPI jobs? Like 10% of what? I think it's probably 10% of the, the number of jobs. I don't have a good sense of the number of hours. I, I need to do, get back into doing analysis of our jobs. I haven't done that in a while. I have other folks doing it and they're looking at other metrics, but I have, I'm usually more interested in these kind of things too. Um, Sure. I have some questions on sort of the idle time and stuff like that, but I think it'll make more sense after you go through this next section. Well, uh, so yeah, so in terms of idle time, um, because because of the responsiveness of the, the scheduler, that, that actually is a great lead into the, this next section here on preemptible uh, batch jobs, uh, batch execution. Um, it's hard to go get away from utilization. And what we often found was utilization in the 50 to 80% zone. And, but we would have times where, you know, we would be around 50% utilized. Um, and it, it, when you have really cool hardware to use, it's like, where are the users? Why aren't they all using it? And especially when you know, like at the end of a fiscal year or so, you're gonna have a lot of scrambling to get jobs running and, and get results off the jobs. Like why, why aren't folks using this more? Um, so 
we, um, our management was pretty good with uh, having a range between like, let's say 50 and 80% and utilization pretty consistently. Um, even on evenings and weekends is another story. Actually, our weekends are often the most, um, the, the highest utilization, just because people, uh, our users tend to fire uh, off larger simulations on Friday afternoon. Um, but uh, our, our uh, interactive utilization is pretty active during the day and it goes sometimes uh, well into the evening and early night and starts off again early in the morning. But we had these idle systems available. And so um, even in our first instantiations, our first 32 node cluster had, a capa had some scheduling capability to uh, try to uh, accommodate batch jobs along with all of the, the interactive jobs. Um, but uh, we still would find ourselves with nodes that weren't being used. Um, naturally, uh, the cloud uh, providers uh, have spot jobs, have ways to um, run low priority jobs uh, that can be interrupted and just don't charge as much um, because they, are, they can be interrupted and they, they, there's no guarantee of, dis, um, of uh, delivering the results off them. Um, in terms of preemption, all the major schedulers have preemption capabilities and there's many ways to do it. Um, but uh, the challenge for us was both enabling the preemption, but we did not want to sacrifice that rapid launch time that we, um, that we had enabled. Um, and our users have come to expect uh, for that interactive capability. Um, it's not very interactive when your MATLAB job takes five minutes to launch. And with these distributed, uh, the, the preemption capabilities, we would sometimes see two to 10 minute um, preemption times while the scheduler is methodically going through all the jobs that are running and killing them. Um, so we really needed to keep the launch times uh, very in the 10 second to at most 60 seconds for like 16,000 core kind of jobs. Um, we tried a number of capabilities to do this um, from queue management policies to resource allocation policies. Um, we tried things like canceling the, the low priority jobs to requeuing the jobs. Um, figuring out what what to do with uh, jobs that are in queued as well as what to, whether to uh, requeue the, the jobs or not. Um, and what we ended up settling on was uh, some cron jobs that are out of the loop that enables us to um, to and I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, as I mentioned, uh, oh, so actually before I dive into this this uh, um, table here, um, I need to explain a little bit about job types um, and partitions. So in terms of partitions, this is whether you have a single queue or two queues, a, uh, a, a spot job queue and a regular queue, or just uh, a single queue. Um, in terms of job types, uh, the individual jobs are single processes and MPI jobs. Array jobs are you know, job arrays. And then we ha there's a special moniker that we have where we have a special way of launching whole node jobs called triple mode, where we allow our users for a variety of languages to specify the number of nodes, the number of processes per node, and the number of threads per process. And that we call triple mode. And that al allows us to do kind of a two-stage um, uh, dispatch of jobs onto nodes where we take over the scheduler takes over the whole node and then a local script launches all the processes and threads on that that node in that two-stage process so we really wanted to have all our job types uh, available um, didn't matter to us how many partitions we really wanted to requeue and as you'll see in the next couple of slides um, the the automatic scheduler lua subscription and uh, manual were all just t taking far too long for our requirements. So we found a way to do it with job scripts. What the, this job, cron job does is once a minute, it looks at how many jobs are running, how many nodes are, cores and nodes are available, and it adjusts a, a particular, the max trez per user in the second, in the spot queue 
to uh, limit how many um, of these speculative executions can be run. And the other thing that it does is it guarantees that there's always going to be a set of nodes of each of the processor types available so that when a, an interactive user launches, they automatically get launched to those empty nodes. And then it goes and makes, uh, you know, in the next time the cron job runs, it prunes away jobs, the speculative jobs that need to be uh, stopped running in order to, to uh, open up some more resources for subsequent interactive jobs. Um, and um, what the, these show uh, for automatic preemption, nothing uh, milliseconds per task. We, we really need that way down in under a millisecond per task. Um, none of the automatic preemption really worked for us. But we found that with this cron job preemption with high watermarks uh, to keep uh, some nodes idle was really the way to go for us. Um, and we are we have been rolling it out over the past few months. I don't have any statistics yet for you on how that how that has been going. We do have several users using it, but basically the way we see it is that we have a few users or a few teams of users that have access to this this spot queue to run speculative jobs that can be preempted. And they are very much bulk synchronous types, types of uh, execution runs. And But we can also do it with MPI jobs. Um, it is, my personal uh, opinion, it's not, I don't think it's the best fit, um, but uh, we have some users that may, that have expressed interest from the MPI ranks. So did that answer your question about idle nodes and such? Yeah, I think it's, it's part of it. The other thing I was curious about is, you know, do you essentially under allocate the system to kind of make sure that there's a little bit of spare capacity? That's right. That's right. And we do get into oh, <laughs> another little tidbit of this is when we do when we do reach capacity, my entire team, including myself and the other team leads, we all get an email saying we've exceeded capacity. Um, start looking at what's going on. We can't run any more interactive capabilities. So that really motivates us uh, to help shape the user's usage um, and also motivates us to help them use the resources very efficiently. Have you done any experimentation over time? Like how much, you know, I think you mentioned sort of 80% or 50% in these ranges, but have you done any experimentation of like how much you can allocate of the time before you get more likely to reach those danger levels? Um, nothing, so yes, we have, but not as much quantitative as it is more qualitative. Okay. Um, we do find um, when we give certain users fairly large allocations, we need to be really careful about that. Like That's if we. If we give, um, it actually just happened in the past couple of weeks on our campus system. We uh, we had some users who we had given, uh, uh, I'd say like a, th a sixth of the system allocations. And it got us into a little bit of tight waters because we then had some other users that had tight deadlines and we had to start managing users and ratchet those two users back some um, to, alloc to uh, accommodate the, the tight deadlines. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it doesn't get you out of uh, queue management. <laughs> it just gives you different problems. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. so, uh, yeah, there's no magic bullet. <laughs> well, thanks. But it does make make for very interesting conversations. Um, so, well, let's uh, let's jump to the the last thing here with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and I'm going to broaden the, the scope a little bit more that there are actually many things beyond uh, just Jupyter Notebooks that you may want to have uh, access to on a supercomputer um, like TensorFlow, TensorBoard, um, like the control panels for a Cumulo database, um, and even our Cumu uh, KVM virtual machine system has inter had interfaces, uh, web interfaces to see what's going on. There's a number of challenges that you have here with these, uh, with these application, web-based applications, uh, not the least of which is how we usually architect the network for our 
for our computers. And that is usually we only give uh, users access to the front end, to the service nodes, like the front end and login nodes and stuff like that in the scheduler. And they have to hop from there onto compute nodes. And we prefer them to hop, do that hop using the scheduler to do all the, the, um, the uh, allocation for those nodes. Um, so uh, I, I will say on our, uh, on the TX Green system, on the Lincoln internal system, we do actually have a network that routes from the desktop, uh, but we still use this capability even on that system. Um, there's further compl complications um, for these applications, and that is um, that there isn't a one size fits all, one solution fits all for ac uh, authentication methods. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to authenticate. Um, they may or may not be using HTTPS uh, for a variety of HTTPS uh, protocols. Um, and SSH port forwarding could be a solution, but um, uh, it's just not something that I want to teach my user base. Um, it's, it's challenging to make work. There are ways to, that you can have others uh, co use, uh, use the same tunnel um, that we just don't want to get into. Um, we actually started um, working on these portals um, about 10 years ago, where we enabled actually full MATLAB parallel job launches through a web portal, um, which we then expanded out um, with uh, do, authenticating users to web applications, um, and then also integrating with a user-based firewall. Now, I should take a quick couple of sentences on the user-based firewall and what that is. Um, for most of us, uh, most supercomputers, you know, that internal network between compute nodes and the compute nodes and the service nodes um, are kind of open. There's no encryption, no verification that it's the same user or same group accessing uh, the open ports for the communications. Um, and for some of our some of our capabilities, we actually needed to have um, a verification that it was. Uh, the same job or at least the same group that is being that is using all the, the ports and uh, all the ports between computers. So you'll see on the next graphic what we have that the user base firewall plays in here. What we built was a way to use um, multiprocessing uh, modules in Apache to take the input, you'll see over, over here some URLs on the, on the left, take the input and allow the Apache web server to do the right thing based on what the incoming URL, components of the incoming URL. So when it has GridSAN involved, that means it's going to the storage. And so it goes to running the right code and to access uh, web dev capabilities within the browser and in the file system to serve back the, the um, grid SAN, what, what we affectionately call our, our central file systems. If that happens to be a DB call, it uses um, a rewrite map uh, in Apache to give access to the, um, make a call to the database and then forwards a lookup to the database um, capabilities and gives access to oops to the database forwarding that you want to access uh, a database in the background. All this is also doing reverse proxying and in some cases even launching uh, processes onto compute nodes in Slurm and then using these dynamic capabilities to connect the user at their desktop through the portal um, in the reverse proxy over to the service. And then finally, the forward two is how we do Jupyter Notebooks which uses a node colon port um, uh, rewrite map. And that then goes through the user base firewall. It sees that, makes sure that the user ID, group ID, or um, uh, related group ID, security group ID is the same as the caller, and then establishes the connections to Jupyter and Cumio. Um, we take advantage of those for our databases. Um, as well as our Jupyter uh, portal. Um, this is what the user sees when they want to launch a portal. Um, they have a variety of, uh, this is actually showing the advanced launch options um, in terms of partition and type and how many GPUs they want to use and so on, and what even what Anaconda and Python version they want to use in their notebook. Um, and then 
what it looks like then is just your usual Jupyter Notebook on your desktop, but you're actually running the Jupyter Notebook uh, engine, the, en the MATLAB engine or, or Python engine on a compute node in our cluster on at least one core and as much as a whole core. This actually shows a pmatlab job running. So the Jupyter Notebook is, is bound to a MATLAB uh, instance on that compute node. And then that instance launched three more instances through the scheduler to run a parallel job in the cluster. Um, we built this because at the time uh, that we started building this and like 14, uh, 2014, 2015, other capabilities were not there, but uh, the um, open on demand project out of Ohio Supercomputing Center does a lot of these same things nowadays. So that brings us to the summary uh, of the four lessons learned, a little bit of background on Lincoln and how we catered HPC to our workflows. Um, the four lessons learned from uh, environment, our system, uh, uh, architecture, uh, as well as our ecosystem of usability and productivity and utilization metrics, and then a couple of the tools. And the team is by no means just me. Uh, we've got some really talented system engineers and computational engineers, uh, as well as a very supportive leadership. And I apologize for going a few minutes over. I hope we didn't lose too many people. I think there's still quite a few people around, but thank you very much for uh, Thanks a lot for a very interesting talk, a very comprehensive talk. I think there are a few questions left. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you, if you have time to entertain those. Um, Absolutely, for but, those you know, and more. Okay, so if, you know, if, if people wanna stick around, I, I think we can keep the, keep the conversation going here for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but again, thanks a lot, Albert. You're welcome. Um, I think that a few of the questions popped up in the chat here, I think starting yeah. with uh, whether or not you looked at job suspension with suspension so yeah so that is actually the the one above that let's go well i'll start with the job suspension one since that's already been asked um we have looked at job suspension where you um you basically let the lower priority job continue to suspend on the node in virtual memory um but we quickly ran into memory issues so another little uh thing uh, kind of a tidbit of information about how we run our nodes is that we do not actually, we, we have virtual memory enabled, but our virtual memory is exactly as large as our physical memory. So we really don't have any overflow space for the virtual memory to, to, um, to take, to be able to absorb the suspension of jobs. Um, and so we got into, very quickly got into memory uh, consumption issues. The reason that we do not have any spillover into virtual memory, uh, into true virtual memory, is because of the high productivity languages. Um, they really, really slow down when your when you, their pages of memory start going out onto disk. Um, it is dramatic. Uh, it's <laughs> our users say that it's like dropping a boat anchor on their job. And so we found that we really had to contain the amount of memory available. And so that ended up kind of putting a, a, an end to our exploration of job suspensions. Um, do j spot jobs have a job, have a short wall clock time, wall time limit? Um, do the, in other words, do the spot jobs have a shorter wall time limit? Um, the spot jobs do not by there is no limit in terms of policy but we do encourage our users to kind of hit a sweet spot of not being so short that they're uh, exhausting the scheduler and consistently scheduling more and more jobs and dumping lots of jobs into the queue where then queue management becomes difficult um, but also not being so long that they're ex that that being truncated would really affect their throughput. So we usually, kind of the sweet spot for, for these spot jobs is in the five to 10 minute region um, so that you get enough work done and have made progress in case you do get preempted, but are also not doing so many like Python relaunches or MATLAB relaunches, um, environment relaunches that uh, you are filling up the queue and spending a lot of time spinning up your jobs and spinning down your jobs. So 
Um, let's see, are those preempted jobs capable of resuming execution where they left off? Um, yes, but only if they, it's up to the user to do checkpointing. So if they do, and some of our users do do checkpointing even on bulk synchronous uh, jobs, um, they will they will keep track of what work they got done and what work they didn't get done, and then launch users again when they're able to, to pick up where they left off. Um, but we don't do anything for them. Uh, if When we kill it, it does re get requeued. Uh, when we preempt a job, it gets requeued. But if the user isn't doing anything special to, uh, to checkpoint, then it goes back to square one, for at least for that process. Um, next question. Notice on full capacity specifically versus not able to get any resources interactively. Um, the, are you referring to the emails that we get? Or? I think that might be about feedback to users. Um, so when we have, I believe we currently have it that the user also gets, a, gets an email saying that we could not accommodate their interactive job we are currently at full capacity, and I think they get the same email we do. Um, we've had a few users uh, say, man, that's a lot of emails that I get. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, welcome to the team. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess I asked that question. I, I was thinking, I mean, that, that's an interesting point you made too, but I guess I was thinking on what, what's the definition of full capacity, right? Is it just that there's something running everywhere or is it that, you can't commit that there's not something preemptible available or, or what? Yeah, kind of both. Um, so we, ha we have gone to having a partition for each uh, processor type. And um, users, out of simplicity, can only run on one, a given job on a process. They can't span multiple processor types. So um, it's more like capacity of that processor type isn't available. So that's what I'm referring to as full capacity. There are times when we are nearing full capacity on all four processor types at the same time. And that's that's scramble time. <laughs> I'm on the phone with users. I'm on the phone with uh, my whole team's on the phone with uh, users oftentimes when that happens. So how much skepticism have you faced? What data or metrics were most effective in showing that interactive access is valuable. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I even face skepticism now, but it is, I, I've, we've, uh, we've become institutionalized as an interactive capability, but um, man, the number of times, it's, it's unco it feels uncountable, the number of times that I have um, justified interactive capabilities um, and, uh, been been met with a lot of skepticism about the value of it um and it part of it comes from you know i understand where their skepticism comes from and in a different organization that isn't so rapid rapid prototyping oriented i totally understand how you end up needing to use batch queuing um in order to get get all the work done get all the allocations satisfied um in a given year um, but uh, man, yeah, there there have been a few years where uh, Jeremy and I have uh, really uh, done a lot of <laughs> soul searching about are we really on the right track for doing this? And our users are are generally very uh, supportive. Um, but uh, when our management sees, oh, you know, you're only at 80% capacity, and other other uh, organizations are usually at 95% capacity. Why can't you be at 95% capacity? Um, it uh, is like, oh man, and, and also even in terms of why can't you do everything on the cloud? And it's like, well, we have special capabilities. Well, why can't you do those in the cloud? Well, we don't own that hardware. Um, and we can't actually do as much, uh, as much of that fine tuning and um, uh, because we're behold we would be beholden to other people's, we'd be renting other people's hardware. So lots of skepticism. Um, uh, and I think from my experience, it's just been uh, explaining those subtleties, explaining those um, what is right for what organization for certain parts of our, or there's actually in our mecha mechanical engineering uh, division, they, they for quite a while were running their own uh, 
cluster with their own scheduler. And that one is completely batch oriented because of the nature of the jobs that they were running at the time. Um, so it's a matter, you know, in our own, there's two other clusters uh, in our own organization that are very batch oriented. And so it's really a matter of being uh, transparent and explaining, you know, for this type of use, you want to do this. For this type of use, it's essential that you do interactive. Um, and, you know, recently that has really come to the forefront with machine learning, uh, especially machine training, machine learning training, and even machine learning inference, where um, those engineering turns are so, so vital. Um, what line of reasoning would you use if you wanted to quantify the cost loss when an urgent job request is submitted, but resources are not available, so it must wait or be blocked? Oh, um, so I would, yeah, I would definitely, I, I probably would do, to jump right to the equation, I'd probably have something in the denominator of that cost benefit equation that captures those lost opportunities of launching those urgent jobs um, that then helps bubble up the, 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 how important those jobs are to getting run when they need to be run. Um, but uh, more importantly, um, it, it becomes a conversation of organizational urgency of running those jobs. Um, and an agreement not because every user's job is urgent to some degree. They really would love to have the answers sooner rather than later uh, in almost all instances. But then an organizational understanding of what urgent really means uh, is also important in, in uh, following that line of reasoning. I hope, William, I, under, I, expl I explained that well enough. Thumbs up. That's good. Cool. Um, let's go to Shreya's question then. Uh, how do you manage running Jupyter or other spawned via portal tools on different classes of backend resources? So um, yeah, that's, that's probably a, a good thing for me to jump into. I kind of glossed over that. Um, so uh, coming back to the screen uh, of what the user uh, looks at when they um, when they want to launch a Jupyter notebook, um, they get to choose uh, what type of hardware, both in the partition that they choose, the CPU type, the number of GPUs. Um, they the what the what the underlying code in Apache then does is it formulates a Slurm job submission for them. Slurm launches the job underneath. In the meantime, the Apache server uh, creates the re reverse proxy uh, entries in its database to um, look to so that when the, the job is launched um, and the notebook is ready to go, the user's desktop automatically gets redirected to where that Jupyter notebook is speaking and gets goes through the reverse proxy to their desktop. Um, so that uh, so that the right processor type is um, brought to bear for that Jupyter notebook. Um, the way I understood your architecture, you have, so the hub, Jupyter hub has a proxy uh, and we run Jupyter hub, it has a proxy, but you guys kind of have a proxy that's kind of above that, that, that you described that lets you get access to Jupyter notebooks like through this interface yes. or the other services that you're running. So you've kind of taken that proxy and kind of elevated it another level. That's right. Um, is it, do you like that design or is there anything you'd like to change about it? I noticed it was like this Apache kind of thing. Is that, is, are you, is it working really well? Is that what you like? Or do you have any kind of issues with like forwarding stuff through that? Or does it keep up with the traffic pretty well? So um, it keeps up with the traffic awfully well. Um, and that was kind of a, oh my goodness, is this really going to work? The, um, the, the user base firewall can at times be a little slow. And so we have tried it for certain clusters. We're we're able to turn that off. We don't have to worry about it. For other clusters who have that have more um, more uh, are, are more exposed, um, we have to keep that on. Um, we we like it a lot. Um, we what it I think the the benefit far outweighs the challenges of keeping it up to date because it is all for us. It's all custom code. Um, that is that is running this stuff. Um, I think 
what we really like about it is that we're not limited to a small set of nodes or a certain set of nodes on which users can run Jupyter Notebooks. We literally could fill the entire cluster up with only Jupyter Notebooks if we really wanted to, um, if, the, if the need ar uh, would arise. Um, I think if we, would, if we were to start today or start, have started two years ago on this endeavor um, of in, instead of 10 years ago when we started on these portals, um, we would probably take a, a long and hard look at open on demand as being as at least enabling this capability uh, or if not other capabilities as well. Because it has a really nice plugin architecture that you can use to enable any sort of web, uh, web based uh, application. Right. I think that's I think that's a question that we don't haven't really looked at. Do we need that kind of uh, capability? But you know, I think that we, we might we've kind of taken the view that we can kind of enable a lot of things through Jupyter Hub and yeah. through the you know the you mentioned TensorBoard and things like that. A lot of people are doing that basically through Jupyter Notebooks and there's mm -hmm. a, a server proxy that runs through that. Yeah. Um, so it, it you know I'm not sure what the limits of that are. Could be that there are limits, and that um, you know we need to be thinking about this at a higher level. Um, yeah, but I mean, Jupiter Hub has a uh, Jupiter team, and Jupiter Hub as a whole has been doing a really good job of addressing all of these scalability challenges as well. And so, yeah, I think again, if we would, we if we had done the analysis two years ago or one year ago instead of ten years ago, uh, we probably would have ended up with something very different. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there, are there any other questions? I don't want to keep you from the rest of your Fridays, but uh, I want to pre I want to say thank you very much for, for the talk. I think it was really interesting. It was uh, very comprehensive and thanks for spending extra time with us for these questions. Glad to. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you all for, for attending. I, I really appreciate it. All right. Well, I'll be, I'll be seeing you soon again, Albert, I guess. Indeed. All right. So. <laughs> okay. Indeed, all right. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.